I'm Michael Bartman, and I'm here at the Wayne Art Center. I have loved Michael Bartman's paintings of buildings since I first met him at the Rosenfeld Gallery in 2010. His show at Wayne features some of his most ambitious works to date. I asked him if he has ever formally studied architecture. I studied landscape architecture at a time when you learn drafting with a T-square and you design and plan view. So most of the symbols you use are geometric. It's almost like a geometric abstraction in plan view, which I always liked. Michael told me about the kind of structures that attract his artist's eye. What I call buildings that are in an in-between state. Sometimes that means an abandoned building. The building had to be built first, it had to have a history, and then when it's abandoned, it has a completely different feel. You couldn't build that from the beginning, so it's that in-between part that I like. The in-between allows for the past, the present, and the future all to inhabit that space. There's unwritten stories of people's lives and generations of workers that are still in those spaces. The spaces are empty. Purposely, there's no figures, and I like the emptiness. And in fact, the space itself is a main character in the paintings. The figure in the painting is the viewer. It's their space. They can roam around and make it their own. Many times, I offer an exit <laughs> from the painting so they can exit and come back at will. So the painting expands out from its actual enframement. The other thing about an abandoned building is without the distraction of purpose, a building is free to be what it is. And often you see architectural models, they don't show any furniture or anything. There's something about that that allows for you to make it your own. Those are spaces that artists inhabit. A developer will buy a building and sit on it, and the artists like those spaces for one, but they also want the cheaper rent. They don't want it to be completely updated. <laughs> they would rather have lower rent. The air conditioning doesn't have to be perfect. The windows don't have to open. I feel like artists are holding them in a state of grace or something for decades. They're like sacred spaces in some ways an artist space. Do you go into these buildings, take photos, or are you working from memory? There's always buildings that aren't so secured, and so I'll go in them and I'll, I'll take photos and walk around and spend time there. And a lot of times I go back in, and then I like to let them sit in my head for quite a while before I actually do anything. I set up a one-point or two-point perspective, so then I play around with the space to meet my needs. I might be, at first, attracted to, to photograph the way the space is, but then I begin to manipulate it. So I might open the space up or, using perspective, change the vantage point of the viewer. It's not like a preconceived idea, but I see something and I'm like, okay, how can I play with it, manipulate it? I've been working in this one abandoned silk mill, and after doing a number of paintings, I feel like now I own it, and then I take it in different directions. If I find myself repeating myself, then I move on to something else. But typically, if it's a good building, I can stay with it for a long time and combine other things I've seen. How do you physically get the perspective? Because it looks pretty good to me. <laughs> it's a good question. So if you're doing one point perspective, the point is on the canvas, or I paint on wood panels, and there's a history to that. There's always an art historian who finds the actual vanishing point in a Da Vinci painting or something, so I, I kind of like that, that, that there's a history of that. Two point is more dynamic. One point is more of a modern point of view, so it squares up with the canvas. The issue with the two point, you know, if I really found the vanishing points, they would be like 30, 50 feet away. So sometimes I move my painting all the way over to one end of the wall. I just put some stripping that's 10 or 12 feet long. With the two point, a lot of times I have to eyeball it because the vanishing point is nowhere near you eye it in and as you go you play around with it. It's just amazing. They are. They're beautiful. Beautiful. You could just walk right through them. 
the visual joy I, and I think most viewers, get from Michael's dazzling paintings is because of an exquisite balance of reality and abstraction. This is something that happens intentionally through his process. I probably spent at least a week and a half on the drawing, a white gesso thing, and I draw right on the panel. That's with a number two pencil, it's not a dynamic drawing. And I'm thinking about what it is I want to say. It's meditative for me. When I say I set up vanishing points and I spend a lot of time with the drawing, it's not necessarily a technical thing. Just like an architect will think about the proportions of the forms, that's what I'm doing. And I don't have to adhere to it once I paint, but it frees me up when I paint to either choose to keep it or let go of it. And I can get away with a lot, because if you walk up to the painting and you see the paint marks, they're a lot of times counter to the underlying drawing. And then you think, well, how's this building standing up? Or how is there volume here when up close it looks like a bunch of marks? I like that abstract part of it where there's this surface tension that's working against the forms. Because the work is recognizable, but I'm not filling in the lines, and I'm not a realist painter in that sense. There's almost two dynamics going on. I like to play off each other. I saw those same two dynamics in a terrific painting by Louis Sloan in a current landscape show at the Pennsylvania Academy. I do know that painting because when I was a student, Louis Sloan was still teaching. I'd come out of my studio, just hanging in the hallway, and I would look at it. He is really pushing the color. How is he getting away with that? Bits of color in the trees in the foreground, and then it's the same colors in the background, but you still see it as foreground background. So he's maybe not doing it logically. Because he knows what he's doing, he, he's seeing what he can get away with. Very powerful painting. And it's large, too, because he used to do a lot of on-site paintings. I learned from Liz Osborne. He said, oh, he saw it. He'd say, I think when I go home to my studio, I'm going to paint that. And he would just do it from visual memory. Because I'm a studio painter, too. I like going out, but I prefer being in a studio. And I think there's a dynamic that happens that you see it. You let it sit in your head and evolve, and then you come to it. Whereas Michael's representational dynamic is rooted in a rigorous understanding of perspective, his expressive color comes from another place. Color, it's very intuitive. It's really an emotional response to the forms. I think people a lot of times see it as, oh, it's realistic, but that's almost an odd thing when you look at the bright orange that's on the shaded side of the building. You accept it as reality because of the drawing. And the more you push that, the more interesting it becomes, I think. I understand value, and it gets like, okay, I could do the same different value of purple, or I could make it orange. So I guess for the viewer, it becomes also emotional. Do you think one of these representation or abstraction, is ultimately going to take over? A few years ago, Richard Rosenfeld had said that the paintings are getting more realistic and more abstract at the same time. That's what I'm hoping for. Mm -hmm.